Hello and welcome to the exhibit floor at ASM Micro. My name is Hazel Barton. ASM is working on a new book about women in microbiology and it's in doing so we're recording a number of interviews about the uh, people who are being featured in that book. It's my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Farrell, who is a professor at Metropolitan State University of Denver, and Mark Mar Martin, who is an associate professor at the University of Puget Sound. Uh, Rebecca has written a book chapter for us on Esther Leatherberg, and Mark was a graduate student who knew Esther. And we've invited them here to have a conversation about Esther and the impact that she's had on microbiology. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you. So please just let, start your conversation and let us know what you knew about Esther. Okay, thank you. Mark, thank you so much for coming to talk about Esther. Oh, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. Can you tell us how you first got to know her? I can. I was a graduate student at Stanford, and I was the first in my family. My brother and I were the first to go to college, but I was the first to go to graduate programs. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have any way to figure out how to act. So I felt a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. in graduate school. So I, I kind of connected with the emeritus professors. And that got me interested in the history of science a little bit. Mm -hmm. I also read Judson's book, The Eighth Day of Creation, which had some fabulous stories. And it was interesting because in my work with Sharon Long, my graduate advisor, I needed a particular set of plasmids uh, to look doing compatibility work. Mm -hmm. And at that time, a certain Esther Letterberg was running the Plasmid Repository Center out of the medical school and department of genetics. Mm -hmm. And I started talking with her to get, at first, to get a hold of the plasmids. But then I learned a whole bunch of history. So what, what did you learn that impressed you when you um, were beginning to understand her story? Well, uh, the first thing I noticed in the index is that she was in the book that I had been reading. And one of the members of my committee, the, probably the most intelligent scientist I've ever dealt with, Alan Campbell, started telling me stories about Esther as well. Mm -hmm. So I was a little put back because this is the Esther I remember that's up on screen. And, and, and she was very welcoming and very funny and I, I really enjoyed chatting with her, but I didn't know her history. Uh -huh. And as I started talking with her, and I would mention something I had just learned, say about conjugation, she said, well, I had something to do with that. <laughs> yes, she did. Yeah, she did. So for people that don't know, if you think about the three ways that bacteria can exchange information, so you've got transduction, you've got conjugation, and then you have transformation, two out of three of those discoveries were very directly um, related to Esther Lederberg. So she discovered um, bacteriophage lambda, and then later documented transduction by lambda. Um, and she and Joshua together discovered the F factor and did the first E. coli mapping by conjugation. So there's a lot of history there. So I have a question for you about that. Do you think, because Esther in many ways was a bit of an outsider. She was a woman, she was Jewish, um, she was the trailing spouse at Stanford. Do you think that her experiences as an outsider may have made her more sympathetic to someone who also felt that way? I think that's exactly it. Um, she told me once that she collected lost souls, and I didn't know exactly what that meant. Mm -hmm. But she was very nice and patient with me. I, I think I've told you that um, she told me I needed to listen to better music than I was listening to in the <laughs> 1980s. I didn't know she was at all musical and played the recorder, and, did, and I think you'll be talking about that music. Mm -hmm. But I started investigating her a little bit, and can we show Esther as she was in, in, her, in her youth? Yeah. This is one of my favorite pictures of her. And, and so I think that's a wonderful picture of her, and I can see that look in her face. Uh -huh. Even when I met her, you know, 30 years, 40 years after that picture was taken, and we, I started asking about the history of what she had done. Most people, of course, are somewhat conversant with her relationship to replica plating. Uh -huh. And she talked a lot about that with me. And I had been doing a certain degree of replica plating at the time. So my focus was how to keep the colonies at the edges transferring more effectively. And that took her into the number of fibers that were actually in the fabric, which you wouldn't think would be interesting to me, but I was very, very motivated to get all those colonies to the next plate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she talked about that history a little bit. And, and it was interesting to connect what I was hearing from her to what I was reading in Judson's book. 
Uh huh. Yeah. And so I, I've wondered as I've learned more about her because her father was a printer. So she was born in 1922 in the Bronx. Her father was a Romanian immigrant who was a printer. He worked 52 weeks in 1939. We know this from the census. And in that census, there's Esther. She's 17 years old. She's a junior in college at that point at Hunter. Um, and you can see on the census, they're all handwritten. You can see where the census taker has written zero dollars for her income and then gone back and corrected that to 60. And I sort of imagine young Esther coming in and saying, wait a minute, you know, I worked last year. She was working in a lab at that time and that she insisted, I imagine in my imagination, that, she, that this be corrected, that the records show she had earned money. She had a remarkable ability. I don't know if it was something that she did when she was younger, but when I knew her, she could communicate in a way that didn't seem abrasive at all. Uh -huh. so you could imagine going back and saying to the census taker, you made this mistake, go fix it. I have a feeling that he walked away apologizing to Esther. At 17, she was probably that tactful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. she certainly was with me. I had a lot of rough edges, and uh -huh. she was very patient with it. And, and it's that whole testosterone poisoning thing. <laughs> And some of that may have been necessary for success at that time, too. Absolutely. That an abrasive woman may not have been able to advance in the same way. She was, she was fairly direct about things that she was involved with. Uh, I remember the first time she talked about thinking about what the F factor was. And I went to Alan Campbell and, and I said, is this really so? And he said, indeed it is. And he said, Esther does not receive the credit she merits. Mm -hmm. And that was nice to hear. Now, mind you, I didn't know the other players involved in this. I just knew what Esther was saying. I had the book, and I had Alan Campbell, who was there when it all happened. Uh huh. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of, of speculation about sort of who did what. And I, as I've talked to people, I, I kind of hear universally that Joshua was a big thinker mm -hmm. and that Esther was much more the experimentalist. And if you look at the pattern, they, they married after a very brief courtship. So. He wrote her a letter about Neurospora she was working on at the time, and five months later they're married. Um, Joshua was also very bright, three years younger than she was. And um, when they married in 1946, which was an interesting time if you think about it, just after World War II, so we're looking at that social um, situation of women being pushed back into the home. And so here's a young scientist trying to do exactly the opposite of that. Um, and so what you see then over the next 12 years until Joshua wins the Nobel Prize and everything changes is that Joshua is writing many, many single author thought papers and Esther's publishing a paper every year or so that is lots and lots of bench work. You know, so you look at these and they screened 35,000 clones or 35,000 mutants rather um, when they were you know, doing these just to publish a single paper. It, it sounds like that really was her personality, to dig in and work hard and be very sure of the facts before she reported. Uh, I think it was James Watson who first referred, gosh, I thought it was me, but it's actually James Watson, that Joshua Lederberg wrote papers of rabbinical complexity. Mm -hmm. And it's really true, they were very, very complex, very interesting papers, uh, things to digest and think about. And, you know, Esther wanted to get to the answers. Yeah. And, and, and I remember talking to her many times about, you know, how to deal with the ins and outs of following an experiment and how to get there and not to give up. Mm -hmm. And she was so very patient because I was in my early 20s and, you know, fight the power and all that kind of stuff. Uh, listened to a lot of punk rock. Again, she didn't care for that. <laughs> and, and she said, you know, you have to take the long view and you have to work through it. And so I, I really want to emphasize that, that Esther didn't seem embittered or angry about things that, quite frankly, I would have been angry and embittered about. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just a delight to learn about her role. And I make sure that all of my students know Esther's name, not just when they replica plate, but the process. I think it was Ed Young who said yesterday, the best way to explain science is to show the scientists. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope we can do. Yeah. So you said, you said something about Joshua's papers being of rabbinical complexity, which I've heard said also. And that maybe is not so surprising. His father was a rabbi. The family had immigrated from Israel. Um, and Esther also was raised in a, an Orthodox Jewish household. 
her parents, her father was a Romanian immigrant, her mother was the daughter of Romanian immigrants. Um, and so she actually learned Hebrew when her cousins wouldn't. So her male cousins refused to learn Hebrew. Um, she was, by all accounts, her grandfather's delight because she did learn Hebrew. So I think she, she grew up very close to her mother's parents. Her father's parents were still in Romania. Her mother's parents, though, um, were very much in the picture. She was named after her grandmother. Her brother was named after her grandfather. Do you think that that background had anything to do with the way the Letterbergs moved through the scientific world? I think so. I'm, I'm sure that on the one level it could be seen as a partnership, but certainly I would argue that more credit should have gone to Esther's contributions. Mm -hmm. I'm in no way trying to denigrate the other member of the partnership. I am simply saying that there was a whole bunch that Esther did that most people don't hear about. The way that she put it to me is that they were kind of a team, and she did once make a comment about the integrity of that team mm -hmm. after, I believe, her marriage ended. But the, the point that I'm trying to get at is they worked together. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, that sounds idyllic, but you know it doesn't have to be that way. And again, as you say, the 1940s, and I, it, I, I often think that if you were raised during a particular period of time, it colors the way you look at everything. Of course, yeah. 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 And so we're talking someone who was essentially 1920s, 1930s, as you mentioned, a, a period of time that where there was prosperity and then deep depression. Mm -hmm. And then a war on. And then a war. Yeah, which, you know, really affected, I think, the trajectory of both of their lives in some ways. Um, so do you think that um, there, there's been discussion about replica plating because they published it together. I, the more I learn about Joshua Letterberg, the less likely I am to actually believe he went to the fabric store and looked at all those different kinds of velveteen and picked the best one. Um, so, you know, and everyone, nearly everyone who knew them says this was her technique. And I've wondered if her father's print shop may in fact have had something to do with that. That she grew up around the family printing business and that the idea of let's stamp this um, it may have actually sort of come from that. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, when I was concerned with transferring colonies toward the edges of a plate, mm -hmm. her immediate response is, what was the, and there's a name for it, the number of fibers uh -huh. in the velvet. There's a name for it, and I don't know what it like is. Like thread count or but something. She knew. Yeah. yeah. And so that clearly was something that was in her wheelhouse. As a, and it had to be because of the experience. I wouldn't know about things like that, would you? Well. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of it. I think right. thinking of it, you know, having watched printing may have mm -hmm. really sort of primed her to think that way. Because the other alternatives were to toothpick things. Yeah. And you can certainly do that. Uh, but not, but you can screen many, many colonies much more quickly this way. And uh, that was a big deal to me at the time in graduate school. And they couldn't have done the evolution experiment really with toothpicks, oh, right? No, so the evolution experiment was essentially showing resistance to streptomycin, resistance to bacteriophage T1 in organisms that have never actually been exposed to those agents. And so they did that by replica plating where they would take a plate and then replicate it onto the selective medium and then look to see what grows go back to the plate that had not been exposed, scrape off those cells, replate those, and do that again. And over time then, they got a pure culture that was streptomycin resistant or T1 resistant without exposure at all, which really refuted the Lamarckian thought that mutation occurs on demand, which had political overtones at the time as well. Right, in Soviet Russia, exactly. Uh -huh. You, you know, one of the things that struck me, it's related to it, is the whole idea of, of her discovery of Lambda, because I certainly didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And then I did a rotation in the lab of Alan Campbell, who's, you know, the king of Lambda. Mm -hmm. and, and I went in kind of, is it, is it true? And he looks at me and goes, yes, it's true. Because it was. And that's yeah. a heck of a thing to think about, and I didn't know. And that's what's so valuable about what we're trying to do in this project, is get that information out there so that people can see the contributions that many, many people have made to the progress of science. And the discovery of Lambda actually was, was delayed in being reported, um, and there's a little controversy about exactly how that played out, but it sounds like Joshua 
was setting Esther's priorities at that point. Yeah. Um, she was a PhD student at Wisconsin and he wanted her working on things that were going to kind of further the work of his lab um, rather than the things that were single author or other author sorts of things. My wife is a mathematician and more than once she said, wouldn't it be great if we could work together on a project? And I've told her, I know people for whom that works, but I know a lot of people where there's like a push me, pull you, mm -hmm. you know, from Dr. Doolittle. You get pulled in two directions Yeah. in the kindest sense of the term. So I think in a perfect world, Esther would have had her own research program. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what many people wanted to support. I know, for example, Alan Campbell worked very hard to get her recognized uh, as being a senior, a senior um, investigator. They, she wasn't tenure track, but there was a way as a, um, as a, a researcher that you could get job security. She was a research professor, right? worked yeah. very hard to get that for yeah. her. Yeah, and that was really the only way she got a faculty position, mm -hmm. I understand, was to accept one without tenure. When finally pressure was brought by several women to say, look, you've got to have a female professor here somewhere yeah. in this department at Stanford. Okay. Yeah. So when they, so what do you think about the effect of the Nobel Prize on this relationship? Joshua was only 33 when he won the Nobel Prize. It's 1958. Um, and in his speeches, Esther does not play a prominent role. In fact, she's not really mentioned. Um, and there's this photograph of her standing there sort of in the full rig in Stockholm, right? It's a white tie dinner. She's got the whole pastel outfit on with the gloves and the hat and the whole bit. And she does not look like she's having a great time. I, I don't know. I can't imagine how it would feel to be part of someone's research program, to be recognized in that fashion, and then have it appear as if it's going to just one person. And there are ways to deal with that. You certainly can talk about the in your speech about the roles others had mm -hmm. for this, you know, remarkable award. But I wasn't there, and it was the late fifties. So I wonder about, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not happy with what happened, but I try to remember that they had a different set of glasses they looked through. Yes, they did, and it may have been assumed that if you give the prize to Joshua, then you've sort of given half of it to Esther anyway. Um, and it's important, you're right, to remember that this was a time when just access to being able to do science was actually difficult for women. Yeah. Um, and so many women married scientists, I think at least in part because it gave them access to the scientific world they wouldn't have otherwise had. I think this is true for some very, very critical experiments in molecular biology that we teach in all of our classes, that there's often um, a person involved in that mm -hmm. um, that doesn't, get prop doesn't receive proper credit. Mm -hmm. So I think Esther's contributions, replica plating, I think the, the actual identification of the F factor, which it means really a plasmid, mm -hmm. uh, phage lambda. But as, as I, I mentioned to you before we spoke, she told me, and I've never seen this written anywhere, um, I could be wrong, but she told me that there were mutants that she found in the galactose opera on a E. coli that were acting in a polar fashion. Mm -hmm. And she said that she believed that that was really an IS factor long before anyone knew what an IS factor was. Uh -huh. And that's when she told me, follow the data, really think it through, because they're talking to you, they're telling you something. The microbes are talking to you. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna make it easy sometimes. So that's a very interesting view of her study subject, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, many people think of microbes as sort of bags of enzymes, maybe. And it's interesting to go back and read her papers. These papers from the 1950s, it's a bit like reading Chaucer, right? You sort of know the words, you sort of figure out what's going on, but it's, it doesn't mean exactly the same thing. And they're really struggling at that time trying to overlay eukaryotic genetics yes. onto prokaryotes where it just doesn't ever really fit very well. So it's kind of jolting. You read about the E. coli nucleus and think, wait a minute, you know. Um, and so they're really trying to find sexual activity in mm -hmm. bacteria, which, you know, very much colored the language that was used to describe it and still does, sort of leading us to have to explain to students that this isn't really sex. Or, or not the way you mean it. Not the way we're used to thinking of it in eukaryotes. Although every time you talk about, I, I haven't done this in a while, but where you talk about the device that will allow a conjugation to occur and then stop it after a period of time, that's called interrupted mating. Right. And then everybody kind of snickers in class about that. Ah, okay. Said, that's not quite like you're thinking. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, I wanted to say, I don't know um, how long we're going to be talking, but I wanted to be sure and show something. Um, an artist friend of mine, Maggie Middleton, made a, a wonderful diagram of, of, I think, of a photograph of Esther that you would like and, and her major contributions to the field. Now, Maggie Middleton is known as Vexed Muddler on you know, Twitter and Etsy and all the rest. Mm -hmm. But you can see what she did, the idea of, of an F-factor interacting with an episome, or, or with a chromosome, I should say, uh, replica plating. You can even see there's some things missing between the replica plating, mm -hmm. and bacteriophage lambda. And, and that's a really nice, that, that's how I like to think of Esther. It, it is a beautiful image. The one thing that I'd comment on there is there's a DNA molecule, of course, behind Esther's head there. And if you go back and you read those papers in the 1950s, even the ones that are sort of post Watson and Crick by 1955, 56, DNA never makes an appearance. Yeah. So there's still doubt. There's still a lot of unclarity even though we're beginning to get data um, about exactly how these mechanisms work. I mean, that's one of the things that our students have real challenges with because they are raised up knowing. They, they watch the They Might Be Giants video and understand about you know, DNA, but the fact is they didn't. And, yeah. how, and how they actually came to all that is fascinating. And people like Esther were part of that. And they don't get quite the spotlight that they should get. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm very hopeful about this book project, that you all can, can really put the spotlight on some of the people that we hadn't heard of before. I think it'll be very inspirational for a wide number of people. When you think about the tools that Esther had available to do the work that she did, mm -hmm. it's really daunting. And yet she was, in my conversations with her, quite la-da-da, this is just what I did, that was my day. I went and I did that work. Mm -hmm. Do you think she would have been able to do that work without Joshua? I do. Do you? Yeah? Yeah. I mean, my suspicion is that she probably would have followed the Tatum route and worked in Nerospora primarily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Uh -huh. But I, she had all the tools necessary. And, and if you want to, and, and, and we should, I think that Joshua's big picture view of things directed the, you know, her, her research in a way that was very productive for her although not recognized the way it should be. So you might think perhaps if there wasn't a person like Joshua in whatever field Esther worked in, maybe she wouldn't have done as much. I find that hard to believe. Uh, I think that if she had worked with, with Tatum and Beetle, she would have continued down that route. Uh -huh. And she didn't, you worked with Beetle, of course, on Neurospora as a, a master's student. That's right. Yeah, which is what originally led her to Joshua, or Joshua to her, I guess, That's actually. Right. Yeah. Uh, so she was really all around that Nobel Prize, yeah. right? So it was her master's advisor, her husband, and her husband's doctoral advisor that won that prize. And, yeah. and to me it's interesting because in science sometimes you're, you're prize-driven, paper-driven, whatever it is. But one thing that struck me about her, and she told me this, to have balance in my life, and for her, it was music, and it was the type of music that you know much more about than I do, mm -hmm. which I hope you can talk about in a moment. And she told me it was really important to remember that it's a human profession, and it's important to enjoy your life. Uh -huh. And I think that, that first picture that we showed, which is, is the Esther that I knew, she's smiling, and that's exactly how she smiled. So she's thinking about that work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Um, Long before anyone advises, else was saying that. Yeah. What type of music would you, because you were, she played recorder, I know she that. She played recorder, so medieval and Baroque was really what she was motivated by. And her second husband, uh, Matthew Simon, on the website that he put together in her memory has got um, recordings of the music that was played by a, a, an orchestra that's still in existence, the Mid-Peninsular Recorder Orchestra, uh, which plays a lot of early music. And Esther, being Esther, didn't just stop with the music. So she was an accomplished recorder player, played so they come in different sizes and she played several of them, which is not that easy because they're in different keys. Uh, but she was also, she realized that that was dance music, that this is all music that's meant to be danced to. And so she felt to understand the music, she had to learn the dances as well. And so she, she got interested in the dances and I think was always interested in textiles because she got interested in the clothing that you would wear as you perform those dances as well. Um, so, so that was, I think, a, a, you know, aside from just giving us a little more insight into who she was, 
Um, I think it also tells us something about the thoroughness of her, her interests, that she's not going to look at something superficially and be satisfied. I, I've known a lot of people who are very deep thinkers and, and hard workers, but Esther had such a good balance and, 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 and a serenity that was remarkable. And it might be born out of lots and lots of experience, of course. Mm -hmm. But you know, I was young and the more I learned about her, the angrier I got that she wasn't given more credit. And I understand that that might not be the way everyone sees it, but I was sitting next to her at the time. Mm -hmm. And she would just talk to me about the quality of life. And if you get a chance, anyone listening or watching, to, to go to the website that they put, that you know her family put together, it's mm -hmm. quite lovely, and there are lots of letters and photographs, and and there's you can spend the whole day studying Esther. Lots of anecdotes, you yes. know. So, her her second husband, who I'm very grateful for, because I think she had some unhappiness in sort of the middle of her life. Yes. Her marriage to Joshua ended in 1966 after 20 years. If you look at the Stanford years, Joshua and Esther went to Stanford right after the Nobel Prize, and he established the Department of Genetics there. She couldn't have a job in that department because of nepotism rules, so she was in medical microbiology. Um, but you know, if you look at, at um, that time, it, it seems as though the last few years of that were not very happy. Um, and if you look at the photographs of them together, they don't seem like they were enjoying each other's company very much. And it seems like there was a period then, kind of a long, lonely period in her life, where she was curating the plasmid center and then later transposons and insertion sequences. So if you discovered a transposon, you wrote to Esther to get a number for it. So she kept track of all of that. Um, and then she met Matthew Simon, her second husband, in 1989. They married in 1993. And I think she had you know, some happy years yes. there at the end. He had a family, and I, I think that I'm, I'm very grateful that he was there. And this legacy website that he put together is lovely, with stories um, about things she recalled, um, everything from her mother what squeezing a tomato onto a piece of bread, and that was her lunch, because wow. it was the depression, and that's what they had. Um, or many anecdotes about quite famous scientists that she'd met, and photographs, and things of that nature. Yeah. So. so what else? <laughs> I love me some Esther. So what can I tell you further about her? Um, so we had lunch, as I said, several times at Stanford. Mm -hmm. and, and, and often we would, you, you know, I would take her to the Trestor Union and she would insist on paying. And then she said we had to have packed lunches. <laughs> and I hadn't packed a lunch ever. So I didn't know quite what to do, and I had to you know, take, ride my bicycle to a store to go get the stuff, because I didn't want Esther to be mad at me. And she wouldn't be, she would just say, oh, Mark. Oh. And she was like, I, I, I don't know, I had just lost my grandmother at the time, and, and maybe, maybe that's kind of how I saw her a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I also had some wonderful conversations with her about the discovery of plasmids and the nomenclature of them. And when I say plasmids, I'm talking about environmental plasmids, the ones that carry multiple drug resistance elements. The ones that already exist, not exactly. the ones we build. Exactly. Yeah. That was just in the last 10 years that they've been doing that. So it was really quite remarkable that she had her fingers in a lot of stuff that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. She knew everyone yeah. because of her connections. She knew everyone. Again, those letters are quite fabulous. Mm -hmm. Oh. Thank you, Mark, so much for well, coming to talk to us I've about I've really Esther. enjoyed chatting with you about it. I thank you all for listening to it, and, and I hope you learn a little bit about Esther because she's really worth your time. Thanks. Should we start? They tell you to put your chin right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I became an ASM member in 1981. 95? Um, since 2008. I joined ASM in 1974. I've been an ASM member for 41 years. I think I first became a member in 1989. Seems like all my career. And I'm willing to bet it's a decade. My first ASM was 1993. I still have a picture of me holding the program open sitting on the hotel room bed, really excited because for the first time ever I saw my name in print associated with microbiology.
When I was a graduate student at Purdue in 1980, it was the thing. I mean, if you were going to be a microbiologist, you joined the ASM. It was just really that simple. The ASM is very special to me because I became a member in 2002, and when I first attended the, the meeting at Salt Lake City, Utah, I met my PhD thesis mentor, Dr. Arturo Casadevall. And so ASM kind of introduced me to the PhD world. Definitely the most important thing is that ASM has provided me with a graduate fellowship. So they've helped support me during my graduate training. Um, in addition, I've gotten a lot of networking opportunities and I've met a lot of really great people through ASM. And we can share our work and connect and they can teach me things that I don't know and I can teach them things that they don't know. And just that partnership and working together, that's what scientists do, to share your work. And it's the most exciting thing to learn about new projects. ASM has actually done a whole lot of work and given me the kind of exposure not, I wouldn't have had if I'm not a member of ASM. Many brains are better than one. So, great thing. It's a really member-driven organization. I love that. I've always loved that. Could make the bigger, the better, the, the more the merrier. You want to do microbiology? Become a member.